Amen. Thank you, Lord. Father, we lift up the totality of our being, a singleness of vision and a singleness, Lord, of purpose, our lives submitted, our lives, Lord, available. And I ask this morning, Lord, and in the coming days, a special anointing of impartation of your word, of your desire. And I thank you, Lord. Oh, I thank you, Lord. Father, in Jesus' name, I ask, Lord, that we be quickened, anointed, enabled, Lord, to hear that the word will fall into fertile soil, prepared. I thank you, Lord. Father, we sanctify this time. Our brother's with us. We sanctify it. We separate ourselves from the earth, from the mundane. We lift up our being into the spiritual, into an apprehending of you, Lord, in the totality of your being. Father, in the authority of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, we push back principality, power, every hindrance, every negative factor. That which would hinder in any way, we render null and void in Jesus' name. Father, we release a flow of enabling grace, of anointing, in both the expression and the reception of your word. I thank you, Lord. And I ask, Lord, Brother and Sister Warnock, while they're here, a special working of your grace, of your love, of your purpose within them and upon them in the furthering of their work and ministry. I thank you, Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Father, in Jesus' name, have your way in these services, in this special time. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. And I would ask, Lord, that you, Lord, be very present in all. For we acknowledge you. For you've said, Lord, that if you are lifted up, that all men will be drawn. And I thank you. Direct us, guide us now, Lord. And in all, carefully, we give you the glory. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. <clears throat> that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And that which is born of the flesh can only be comprehended or understood through the intellect. And it stops there, and it's limited by our intellectual capacities, which are rather limited in perception and our ability to, to really understand. But that which is born of the Spirit, and I can honestly say and rejoicingly say this morning, our brother George Warnock is born as a man that's born of the Spirit, and he's born up into a place of vision where he sees beyond many that are contemporaries. Remember Brother Follett one time saying that, that when he was young and, and was able to go out, that, that there was not the doors, the open doors of, of receptivity because people just didn't understand and some years later, a lady said to me, she said, do you know what was wrong with John Wright Follett? And I said, what? She said, he was born 50 years too soon. In other words, he saw beyond this day. And in the restoration of the word of the purpose of God in bringing forth, the Lord has those that are seers that see beyond. Our brother George Warnock is a seer. He sees beyond the present day. 
far beyond it. And if we're going to receive that which is born of the flesh is flesh, if you try to listen with your intellect, you're going to lose it. If you listen with your spirit and believe that the word is going to fall into fertile soil, that word will germinate and become a part of your being. And you'll understand. Brother Warnock, you're free to express yourself. There's no clock. <laughs> the bells are shut off. <laughs> and you're free. And Lord bless you. And all you got to do is turn. Well, it's good to be here. And uh, I'm going to be very away from you and me. And we just trust that we always know the mind of the Lord and ministered by His Spirit. So let us just turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We'll read a few verses and then perhaps deal with some of the highlights in this portion. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Albeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, full grown, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world, that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, a secret, even the hidden wisdom which God foreordained or ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, and he's talking about the things that he's speaking, you see, as it is written, the things that I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God, or the depths of God, not just things about God, but God's very depths, the depths in God's own being. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. And we shall finish the chapter now. We have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. The Lord has blessing to this word. I think Brother Taylor has already indicated what I uh, wanted to emphasize this morning and perhaps in the days to come, that God desireth truth in the inward part and that it's not enough to have knowledge, but knowledge must become truth, if I can use that kind of an expression. We know things. Paul says we all have knowledge. We all have a certain amount of knowledge, one area or another. Then he went on to say, but knowledge puffeth up, but love buildeth up. 
It says in the authorized version, knowledge puffeth up, but love edifies. And you sort of lose what he's saying because the word edify simply means to build up. So what he's saying is knowledge will puff up and get very big, but there's no more in it if it's puffed up than before it was puffed up. But love buildeth up and so that there's an addition. There's, there's always an addition to true knowledge if it is producing that love, you see. Love buildeth up. And I think there's a great overbalance in the church in this area because there's no doubt an awful lot of knowledge in the church and I'm not referring to false things. There's a lot of real knowledge in the church. But I think there's a great unbalance because uh, in spite of all the knowledge, there's still a great need for love. What is it? It's puffed up. I remember reading what A.W. Tozer said one time, and I never forgot it, something to this effect. That if it was in teaching, if it was in Bible knowledge, if it was in learning, I mean true Christian learning, this would be the most spiritual era of the church. But he says, if history goes on, it, this era will no doubt go down in history as the greatest era of Babylonian captivity, captivity in the history of the church. And yet you never saw so many good books and tapes and songs. He says, what is it? I, was, I went on reading because I was curious what his concept would be. And he says, I think it's lack of vision. Lack of vision. So we have the knowledge, but somehow we don't, our vision is muddied. As far as I'm concerned, I believe God gives us a little knowledge. He's pleased to impart knowledge to us. But his purpose in imparting knowledge is to give us that vision. This is what I want. I'm showing you this. This is what I want. Instead of that becomes another doctrine that we can glory in. Instead of a vision to pursue. And so I, I just throw these things out and trust that the Lord will quicken that to your hearts. That in our quest after knowledge, and certainly we come to a place like this to get to know more, that in our quest after knowledge, a <clears throat> real desire will be that that which God reveals becomes something operative within us. Not just something to uh, delight our hearts and minds as we hear it or read it, but something God wants us to enter into. <clears throat> Not denying, of course, that we have to wait for many things. And I'm not saying everything that we say or that is said from this place is something that you, you know, I must go home and have it operative. I'm not saying that. But that everything that is said by the Spirit, I believe God would build, would build into our hearts and lives till it becomes a part of us. In one realm or another. <clears throat> because even if you have it in the realm of faith, it's still real. Sometimes we're inclined to think, well, faith, you know, like the little guy said, what's faith? Said the little Sunday school boy. Oh, he says, believe in what ain't. Well, it's not really that way. It's believing what is. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence. It's substance and it's evidence. It's real. Maybe you're not laying hold on it in the way you would like, but it's still very real. I didn't intend to get into this matter of faith, but I, I want to, Lord willing. Faith is real. It's the substance of what you're hoping for. So that if you and I die without really appropriating many, many things that we believe and are expecting and anticipating, if there's real faith for it, we won't really miss out on anything. Because Abraham never did enter in 
to the fullness of that for which he was hoping. These all died in faith, not having received the promise, that is, not having seen the fulfillment of it, but embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims in the earth. Nevertheless, they were looking for something, the, the thing, they were believing for something far beyond that which they had received. For Abraham's seed did receive the land of Canaan, became their inheritance and all that. And Abraham walked through the land, lived in the land. He lived in Canaan for much of his life. So did Isaac and Jacob. And still he realized, yeah, I know God promises this, and so I'm wondering at it, but there was something there that didn't quite satisfy. His great longing was, not oh God, let me possess this land, please, before I die. He looked for a city that had foundations whose builder and maker was God. <coughs> and Abraham, the one man who was picked out of all characters in the Old Testament, all these great men of faith, if Moses, uh, David, Joshua, name them, Abraham is the one man that is picked out of all those men as the father of all who believe. What did he do? I think he had a little battle with some people that come up and captured Lot and his family. But he didn't do much, as I know of. But he walked with God. Received promises and embraced the promises. Wandered about as a pilgrim and stranger. Never did receive what he was really looking for. But all the while he was here, he looked for his city that had foundations whose builder and maker is God. And so may God lead us in a way that will cause us to seek him that that which we know might become more experiential, even if it's in the realm of faith for now. For certainly it has to be in the realm of faith before it'll come any higher and all about it, faith, hope. Charity, and the greatest is charity, and that's the ultimate, and let's always keep that in mind. People say, oh yeah, we got to have love, you know. You've got to get these gifts working. got to have love, but you got to have all these, well, as if love was sort of something comes in, you know, to uh, give us a little boost, instead of that being the total ultimate, the total ultimate of all our pursuit after God. And the reason we don't evaluate it as we should is simply because we haven't seen much of it functioning. But when we come to see the tremendous power and glory in love, it'll be something we'll, we'll never rest until we come into it. Love is God! And God brings us to that. So certainly we need the gifts, and certainly we need the ministries, and otherwise I wouldn't be here. But the purpose of all these ministries is to edify the body of Christ. Till out and in and working in the body of Christ in the earth is the fullness of God's love, which the total answer to every human need. God's total answer. The ministries are not the answer. The ministry is God's provision to impart to God's people that which they need in order to grow in him. Come to the fullness. Come to that fullness that God desires. And so may God begin to work in us that process whereby the knowledge he gives us becomes faith and vision and hope, expectation. Not just something to tuck away in our minds is another thing that we learn, but something to swallow. Something we chew on and it tastes good, sweet in the mouth, but in swallowing it, it becomes bitter. 
The Passover lamb, they were to feast upon it. Roasted in the fire, they had to feast upon it. But it was roasted with bitter herbs. It had to be eaten with bitter herbs. And so we like the glorious gospel without the herbs, the bitter herbs. But not so if you're partaking of the Passover lamb. It's good. It's life-giving. But with bitter herbs shall you eat it. Because it's in eating of the bitter herbs that all that bitterness of your old life is removed. It's in eating of the bitter herbs that the bitterness of the old life is removed. You've heard the old saying, you don't like this medicine, I know. It's bitter, I know, but if it isn't bitter, it won't do you any good. So the bitterness is intended to remove the bitterness, to sweeten his mouth. And he'd like to keep it there. David said it was like honey in his mouth, sweeter than honey in the honeycomb. But David swallowed it too. And that's why we have the book of Psalms. Because in the book of Psalms we have the outpouring of the travail of David's soul as he went through deep waters and bitterness and troubles to the point where God, why have you forsaken me? What's this all about? Perhaps little did he realize that he was to be in a small way, sort of a prototype of his great, 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 great grandson that was to come, the Lord Jesus. Many of the things that he uttered really belonged to the Lord Jesus. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? David meant it. It was, he felt that. But he was uttering a prophetic lamentation of his difficulty. For his greater son was going to utter that very same cry on the cross. And so Paul says, I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness. Because that was his pursuit to know only Jesus Christ and him crucified, because it was not only his pursuit, but something that he walked in when he came to Corinth, he came in weakness and trembling. And someone stands there boasting about how much, you know, how much power he's got, how much liberty he's got, how much uh, boldness he's got. You wonder sometimes if they know Jesus Christ and him crucified. Because knowing him includes that inward knowledge of him. It's not just that mental knowledge of him. That inward knowing of him that causes you to be, become acquainted with who he is. And Paul discovered something which we all must discover sooner or later. The sooner the better, but God gives us a little time of rest after we come to know him. Time of rest, a time of rejoicing in our salvation. Rejoicing in what he did for us, which, of course, we must do all our lives. But the time comes when he wants us to begin to recognize, yes, he died for me. But you were crucified with him, too. And looking at the cross, yes, that's where he died for me. But the time comes when, as God shows us the way, as God gives grace to walk in the way, we'll recognize, I, I was crucified there too. I'm not saying that I've ever come to that in fullness, and I don't know that any of us have, but I believe that God is working towards that end in the body of Christ, 
that as a body, as a corporate body, we'll come to that place where we will know and recognize. We live by Christ, yes, but it's only because we were crucified with him when he was crucified. That those nails were going into our feet. We just can't walk any old way we want. Those hands are being driven in our hands that we can't just do what we think we'd like to do. The crown of thorns is laid upon our brow that we might know that the mind of the flesh is at enmity with God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. For only then, I believe, will we individually and as a church know what it means to walk in the power of his resurrection. The power of his resurrection is not available to you and I just to come up to the front. What would you like? Oh, I'd like to have that resurrection life. Lord, we lay hands on this man. We ask that he will know from this day forward the working of the resurrection life of Jesus. Doesn't work that way. However, but how be it, if so be that kind of a prayer is uttered in sincerity, the next thing you will know is a walk in identification with his cross, because that's the way into it. So we don't go around looking for our cross, trying to suffer to be like Jesus. We simply do God's will. It's just something we have to prove individually in our own daily walk with the Lord. We have to prove, Paul said, prove. What is that good, acceptable, or well-pleasing, and perfect will of God? Good, well-pleasing, perfect. Indicating, I believe, that there's progression even in the will of God, that you might be right in God's will this morning. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the next year you would be right in God's will, because God wants growth in all areas of truth. Remember that. In all areas of growth, of truth, there is growth, there's, a, there's development, there's unfolding. Uh, so that we don't become too bound by, well, God told me this or God told me that. Instead of that, perhaps, yes, God did say that, but is there not to be an unfolding of it, a changing of it somewhat? Just as the bud will unfold and there's a flower, the change takes place. And that bud is good, nothing wrong with it, it has to be. You won't have the rose without it. But it has to unfold in God's time and his purpose, according to his watch care, according to his provision from heaven, the sunshine and the rain, it has to unfold. It's not something you can make happen. If you do, you'll open up the bud and maybe smell a little of the fragrance, but you won't have a rose. And so that's what patience is all about. Patience is not a negative thing. Consider it to be a negative thing. Grin and bear it. Patience is really that process that you go through when your faith is tried. When your faith is tried, God calls it patience. The trial of your faith, which is more precious than gold that perishes. And so James then says, let patience have her perfect work. So don't look down upon patience. Oh, you know, he's got a lot of patience. That guy don't have patience, scripturally speaking, is faith. <clears throat> faith. But it's faith in the crucible. Faith being tried, faith being tested. Faith in the fire, when it seems, and that you're inclined to believe sometimes that uh, the enemy is seeking to destroy your faith. Maybe he is, uh, but God has control over the enemy. And always remember that, 
The enemy couldn't do a thing to Job until God gave him permission. You say, I think God's given Satan permission in my life. Well, thank him for it. Pray for grace. <laughs> but he doesn't have full control. God has control. And he says, so far, you can do this no further than this. Okay. And he'll go as far as he can. <laughs> And Satan knows it. He knows it. And God boasting about Job. And Job is there thinking God's forsaken him and God's boasting about him. God boasts about Job, I think, to give Satan something to complain about. Yeah, but God, you put a hedge around him. I can't get at him. God said, I'll right, take away the head. But you see, we, Job didn't know these things. You and I know it because we read about it. But then because our circumstances isn't an affliction like his, like his was, we don't consider it's the same enemy that's uh, doing the work. Is with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And I believe the more we come to embrace the cross of Christ, the more God will be able to build into our hearts and lives this weakness, fear, and trembling. Because we realize crucified on the cross Oh, totally helpless. <clears throat> Crucified in weakness. Christ, the Son of God, totally weak on the cross. But he walked that way, and therefore he was able to go to the cross. Because he walked in that kind of weakness. We don't always recognize that because we don't always read the fine print. But if you read the fine print, you'll find a lot of things there that we pass over in the larger print. Jesus said when he was accused of doing something on the Sabbath day that ought not to be done in the minds of the people, healing a man. He has said in so many words, well, listen, no, I didn't really do that. The Father that did that. I can't do anything. I can of mine own self do nothing. That's the words of Jesus. I know there's a lot of the, what they call the positive gospel. And I'm not saying that there's, you know, I'm not saying it's all error. Because it's very, very necessary that you have positive wires coming into this lighting here. Absolutely essential. But it's just as essential that you have a negative wire there too. Just as essential. The power is in the positive. I recognize that, not even being an electrician. But it is ineffective if there isn't a negative. Just a very simple illustration, but it's true. And it's true in the spiritual realm. If you can embrace the positive and preach it fervently and wonder why there isn't more and of an effectual work coming from it, because a lot of it is make-believe. People insisting, I'm going to have this, God says, have whatever I want and insisting on it and a lot of them ending up in devastation. So Paul says, I was with you in weakness. And because he came to them in weakness, he knew the overspreading of the power of God.
Jesus says, I can't do anything of myself. The Son can do nothing of himself. But whatsoever I hear, that's what I've got to say. The Son can do nothing of himself because of the covenant which he made with the Father. If I can use that expression, we read it in the Old Testament and quote it in the New. One of the singers in the temple was inspired to write this tremendous prophecy. And there in the temple they were slaying sheep and oxen and goats and turtle doves and blood was flowing freely and they were singing, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not. There they were, the blood just flowing. And the singers were singing, Sacrifice and offering you don't want. You don't want it, Lord. And they're doing it. God ordained it and they went on doing it. Rightly so. The singers were saying, you don't want that, Lord. You don't want it. <coughs> Oftentimes, songs will come forth, born of the Spirit, and we sing it. We don't believe what we're singing. Don't believe really what we're singing. Uh, you can think of songs like that. To be like Jesus, to be like Jesus, all I ask to be like him. I think we sang that when I went to Sunday school. And now we're teaching God wants the people like Jesus, and they're saying, hey, see, can't be like Jesus. The songs like that and many, many others are born of the Spirit. Because that's the desire of God, and it's the desire of his spirit, so we sing it, and we don't pay too much attention to the theology of it. But God's desire for theology is that it be translated into the realms of truth. Theology, nothing wrong with that, if you understand what it's all about, you know? Theos, I'm not much on Greek, you know, but I studied a little. God, Word, Theology, I mean, nothing wrong with that. If God is the Word, if the words that we speak unto you are spirit, as Jesus said, the words I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But if God is in the Word, then it's something about God that maybe is good to know, but God brings us to the place when, as it was with the first Logos, the only Logos, I should say, the true Logos, he became flesh and dwelt among us. Tabernacled amongst us is really the word. It's the word that means tent. The word became flesh, literally, and pitched his tent in our midst. We beheld his glory, but you wouldn't see it unless somehow you were enabled to pull back the flaps of the tent. Or if God would pull back the flaps of the tent, that you might see his glory, which happened. We beheld his glory, said John, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. For he was God and was with God. But God who had sundry times and in divers manners, Many different ways, many different times, spake in times past unto the fathers through the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us in his Son. There again I came across a very beautiful note by a 
a scholar, the Greek says, has spoken unto us two words, in three hearts, in son, in son, not in the son, in a son, he's spoken unto us in son, and this scholar made a notation, he says it's hard to explain this, but he says it's not just saying that, you know, the prophet spoke and now Jesus is speaking, but where has God spoken in any ways and dreams or visions or or uh, w- with a direct word to the prophets? Or once he wrote on a table of stone, he appeared in fire. He spoke in many different ways. But now he says he's speaking, wrapped up, as it were, in his Son. So that the Son of God walking in earth was nothing less, nothing less, and God's word himself. Revealed in a way far beyond he had ever revealed himself in the past, with prophets and seers and, and uh, different ways, divers manners. Now God's mode of revealing himself is a, a son. So that didn't, Jesus didn't just speak God's word, he did that. He was God's word. The word had become flesh. The word had become a man. Many just heard a man speaking, but everything he said and everything he did and everything he was and everything that he was in his inherent being that men never did see, it was God's word, God's final revelation of himself to man. I say God's final revelation, not precluding the fact that this son would join unto himself in process of time many other members that we would become members of his body. But the fact remains, the son is God's revelation. Then in the Lord Jesus, the education or whatever, you can bring it forth in a word, simply to express what's in your mind. And so that Jesus didn't just speak the word of God, he was the word. Because more God, the time had come and the purposes of God, when God says, no, I've spoken in prophets, I've spoken in dreams, I've spoken in visions, I've spoken in fire. No, I'm going to give a complete, a full revelation. And everything that was in the heart and mind and character of God is revealed in this man who walked in the earth as the perfect image of God. This is expression of the Father. Lord willing, we'll get into some more of that. Just to say before we digress a little. He didn't stay in earth as that one single solitary voice. He went to heaven to be glorified that in a corporate body in the earth that same logos might be revealed. The same word. Not in all his fullness in you or in you, or in you. But in the corporate body of Christ, it is total fullness. You and I being but members of the throne of God. <laughs> my speech, my preaching was not with enticing, persuasive words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. That's a little frightening. Maybe that's not quite the word, but... There's a lot of attempts made 
to educate young people or aspiring ministers to the place where you can present something with eloquence or refinement of speech. And I think Paul could have done that. But he says, when I came into your midst, I determined I wasn't going to come with that. Why? He says, I don't want your faith to stand in the fact that you heard words that went forth with such eloquence and beauty of expression that you had to believe it just because of the way it came forth. Because your faith won't stand on that. Remember hearing where, I think it is, uh, I noticed Charles S. Spurgeon was one of the men I think it was a Dr. Per- Parker who was also a contemporary in England at that time. And these two men visiting England wanted to hear them both. They were both very eloquent. And both great men. So they went to hear the one man and they, when they came away one of them said, what a dynamic preacher. And they went to hear uh, Charles Adam Spurgeon and they came away and one man said what a tremendous Christ Paul says I didn't want to come with eloquence the words of wisdom that would be attractive lest your faith stand in that and I mean, I like listening to an eloquent preacher. But somehow in recent years, it's lost its luster, but as a young person, I wish I could preach like that. Paul, who probably could have preached like that, maybe he did. On Mars Hill. Maybe he recognized on Mars Hill that he was appealing too much to their intellect, I don't know, but you know, he found a sermon there in the streets in this idol that was erected to the unknown God and they appointed him a day and nothing wrong with what he said, but we don't read of any great dynamic things that happened. There was one or two, it says, that claimed to him it was right after that he came to Corinth and you sort of wonder if Paul was thinking, you know, I gave him a good sermon and I, I know it was from God and all that. Why wasn't there more results? I don't know. If that went through his mind. But when he came to Corinth he says, no more of that. I must walk in the weakness and in the fear and in the trembling that I experience when I see myself crucified with Jesus in the cross. That your face should not stand in the wisdom of men but in the power of God. Albeit, he says, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. Those who have come to maturity. Remember that perfection in the scriptures is not just getting rid rid of that last sinful habit. You get rid of every sin you got and you still be a babe in Christ. And certainly God wants us to get rid of all our sins and I believe he's going to purge the church without spot, without blemish. But getting rid of all the uh, sins won't be the perfection. The perfection is, that's negative. Taking away the perfection is coming into the maturity of the Lord Jesus. And so, he says, we do speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this world nor the princes of this world (coughs) that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in the mystery, even the hidden wisdom, 
which God ordained before the world unto our glory. We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom. And you probably recognize that the word mystery in the scriptures simply means a secret, but a secret that is made known to certain individuals. But nevertheless, a secret. In other words, all don't know. All don't know it. But Paul says, God has given me a ministry to reveal to you his secrets. All don't know it, but view it as given. And understand, of course, when we say things like this, we're not talking about any kind of a secret society where you say to one another, I'm telling you something, but don't tell anybody else. It's declared openly. Declared openly. But the reason it's a secret is because to many it's a strange language. They don't even know what they're saying. What's that mean? Gotta eat my flesh and drink my blood if you don't know life in your nonsense, you know. He declared it openly, but you see, uh, it is a secret because it was only for those to whom the Lord could explain the secrets. And even those closest to him couldn't really comprehend. Jesus says, are you going to leave me too? Everybody started to leave. When he declared a secret openly, which didn't make sense, So the secrets that God gives us to declare to the people of God or to the world will cause a lot of antagonism because they'll only hear they'll only hear those literal words and they won't hear what God is trying to say. So it's important that we seek to speak from the heart of God and not just deliberately try to say things to, you know, that might sound stupid or something. But by words which the Holy Ghost teaches, we will be saying things that will become our accusation against us, their accusation against us. And so the great need is that you and I seek to know and have the anointing to know and to say what God would have us to say openly to the people but because it's the wisdom of God it's in secret to those who have a hearing ear they will hear what the Lord is saying to others it might be a nice story but it won't mean much to them that's why Jesus came to a people, hard of heart, blind in the eyes, gathered them about him and unfolded beautiful things about the kingdom of God in the form of parables. And they heard it, they listened to it, sounded good, they didn't really know what he was saying. The sower went forth to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell upon stony places. Some fell by the wayside. Some fell in places that were infested with thorns and thistles. Some fell into good ground. And sprang up and brought forth fruit. Some thirty, some sixty, some a hundredfold. You ever notice in Jesus' parables how he'd say, He that has an ear, let him hear. Take heed how you hear. They all heard it, I'm sure. And yet they didn't. So they came to Jesus after and they said, Explain to us the parable. Jesus, it's you it is given to know the mysteries, the secrets of the kingdom of God. But to them it's not given. For he says, in them is fulfilled that which Isaiah spoke about. They have eyes, but they see not. They have ears, but they don't hear. They have a heart that cannot perceive. 
for their hearts are waxed gross and their ears are dull of hearing. And then, Lord, why waste your time talking to them? Because he spoke words that were spirit and life. He called the last Adam, whereas the first Adam came and was created a living soul that had life derived from the God who breathed into his nostrils. A living soul, a life, a soul life that gave him a tremendous mind and understanding and all that, but it still pertained to things earthly. But the last Adam came not as a living soul, but a life-giving spirit. A life-giving spirit. And Jesus said, the words that I speak in you, they are spirit and they are life. And I used to wonder too, why Jesus would speak parables and then tell the disciples, they don't see it, they don't hear it. So I realized he was speaking spirit, life. He was depositing in them, in their ignorance, seeds of life that unfolded in the days to come. Two or three years down the line, perhaps, but most of them, when Jesus rose from the dead, multitudes came to know the Lord in Jerusalem. Multitudes who had heard his parables and didn't know what he was saying. No doubt many of them who turned back and walked no longer with him because his sayings were too difficult. So it's not in vain. If you go forth and speak something by the leading of the Lord, by the will of God, and you don't do any fruit for it, an evangelist must have fruit in that meeting or he's apt to move on to the next town. But um, all are not evangelists. And there are those who come and sow the seed. And you go away and you don't see the fruit. You don't expect to. I think we will, though, sometimes. Especially in this last hour when God's doing a quick work in the earth. When the plowman shall overtake the reaper. And the treasure of grapes, him that soweth seed. And so there's the evangelist bringing in the harvest and you and I are going along behind plowing the ground and planting. See, what are you doing? This is harvest time, I know, but it's sowing time too. <laughs> Plowman's going to overtake the reaper. And the treasure of grapes, him that sows seed, is God does a quick work in the earth. So no longer can you and I say, there isn't time to do these things that you're talking about. Because the harvest time is yet. No harvest time is here. But sowing time's here too. It isn't up to you and I to decide how much time we got left. It's in his hands. And I know it is harvest time. And I know time is short, very short. But I know that in this one, two, three years that are left? I don't know. Ten years? I don't know. Three months? God's going to do a work that he has declared he's going to do. Nothing shall withstand it. Man says there's no time. God says I don't need time. I just need a willing and obedient people. Secret. Even the hidden wisdom. The hidden wisdom. Jesus promised one of the churches in the book of Revelation. He that overcometh, I will give him of the hidden manna. I'll give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. The hidden manna.
Immediately, of course, we think of the manna that God gave the children of Israel in the desert. And they were famishing for bread. They were hungry. And they murmured and complained because there was no bread, no water. A natural thing to do. But nevertheless, a faithless thing to do. Because invariably, God will test us and try us concerning our faith. And so God speaks something to your heart. You know it's Him. You're assured it's faith that you have for what God says to do or whatever. You embrace it. It becomes faith within you. But remember, faith cometh from a revelation from God. It's not something you just decide you'd, you'd like to have. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And uh, faith cometh. Oh, not from far off in the heavens, or not from the depths of the ocean, Paul says, but the Word is nigh, and he's really quoting from Moses. The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. Even the word of faith which we preach, so that if there's a going forth of God's word, there's faith right there in that word that goes forth and in your heart to receive it. As you look to him to open your heart. Faith is right here in your mouth, in your heart. It's in the word that goes forth. Faith cometh by hearing. Have you got it? Hearing. Hearing by the word that goes forth. And God was simply trying them for a few days in their hunger. And his whole purpose of leading them through the wilderness and of feeding them with manna Leading them the way he did through desolate areas. His whole purpose was to prepare them. Prepare their hearts for the land of Canaan. It's sad when people are brought out of Egypt and take the highway into, of the Philistines into Canaan. Simply because it's a shortcut. And uh, it, it's sad, I say, because so many times they can't survive in Canaan. The fruit of the land, the power, the, the running brooks, the, the houses all built, the gardens planted. That's a prepared place for a prepared people. And therefore, God has that place prepared. And because he has that prepared place, he must prepare a people for it. But without going too far in that right now. He met their needs. He sent bread from heaven. Manna, fresh from heaven. Every day, every morning. And then, that was for all the people. But then, the priests had a bread that they ate once a week stale bread. Six days old and they ate it on the seventh day. I didn't really mean what I said, stale bread, but we call it stale bread. Lying there a week. But it is fresh because for those six days it was there in the presence of God. The showbread, or more literally the bread of the presence which had been there in the presence of God for six days. And the priest ate that on the seventh day, the bread that had been in God's presence. They ate the manna too. But here was something special for the day of rest. 
And I believe God is enabling his people to partake of that bread of his presence even today. But we, we have to, whenever God brings us into one area of truth or understanding, like I said, we don't want to be gluttons, just desiring to have more and more and more and more knowledge. But our desire should be that this which God has revealed concerning God becomes alive within us. becomes meaningful. becomes something we walk in. I know we, we don't walk in it in fullness, but as God enables, at least by faith, maybe it's a little by hope, because hope is beyond faith too. As you know, when you want to know the meaning of a Bible word, you don't go to Webster's. You go to a good concordance. And we use the word hope. Well, yeah, I hope so. But Bible hope is not that kind of a hope. Bible hope is beyond faith. and begins to anticipate what you're believing. Anticipate it coming into birth, coming into reality. So that in that sense, Paul says, we are saved in hope. So we come into this realm of hope, the uh, the holy place, the uh, the intermediate stage between the outer court and the holiest of all. We have to go through there. And many don't like the ministration of the Spirit, so they try to sneak in, trying to look for a back door into the holiest of all, and there isn't any. We have to go through the holy place to come to the holiest of all. And so we thank the Lord for bringing us into the holy things, the holy place, the table of showbread and the altar of incense and the candlestick. And I believe that's where God has brought his people in these last few years. Very precious place. But and many would like to, they don't like it, they'd like to get into that holy place, that holiest of all place, but they don't like going through this realm. And I realize that oftentimes there are many uh, inconsistencies that God's people get involved in in this holy place and or disturb others and, and uh, turns them away from the things of the Spirit. So we recognize that. But the fact remains that if one's heart is truly after God, uh, he will have uh, hurdles that he'll have to jump over. There'll be obstacles that he might trip over. Jesus said, it must needs be that offenses come. It's inevitable. With every great revival, there's been offenses. You don't like it because it's not really the revival, it's just the offense of things that happen because of those who get involved. And it always happens. And so those whose hearts are uh, not really unto God totally, They'll see the offense of things and turn away, which is sad. But if their hearts are right, they won't stumble. They won't stumble. They can't help it. i got to go this way. Jesus says to the disciples, are you going to turn away now like the rest of them? He says, what can they do? You, you only have words of eternal life. And they knew that. And we know that. And so no matter what comes, Lord, at least are going back. Some get bitter against God, blame God for it. You can blame God for it if you do it in the right way, like Job did. Job blamed God, and God took the blame. God says, I did it. He said, Satan, you moved me to do this to Job. Let Job do the dirty work. God often does that. It's in God's mind to do it. Not as chastisement, not as judgment. Not because Job had missed it, because he wasn't positive enough, because he said, the thing I feared came on me, and oh, Job, you had that crazy old fear, and get away with it. God says, Job spoke right about me. He was the one who emerged from the old works as the man that pleased God. These people that are saying that, they're taking the side of Job's comforters so-called. God said to them, you haven't done, you haven't spoken right. You go to my servant Job and offer up a sacrifice and he'll pray for you. And all. Pardon me for 
you know, it's way back up when I was in there. But you know, you, you start going up the tree, you know, and, and then you get out here, and then, uh, well, now I gotta get back, and then you, you get out here, and then you, you get up, and then, and then you go out here a little, and, well, that's the way a tree is. <laughs> and that's where the fruit grows. But we have to, we have to allow the word that God brings to our hearts as individuals to produce that kind that God wants. And though you come to a Bible training institute, I believe it's a very good one. Don't set up your pattern in somebody. I want to be like him or her. You'll see that sometimes. People have a certain... Yeah, that's that's what I want. Ministry like he's got. Don't do that because you could never have his ministry. Nor does God want you to, nor should you desire it. Because God, God has made every one of us to be a distinct member of a distinct society. a distinct member of the body. Everyone different. Everyone different. So don't mind being different. You try to be some like someone else, and I know there are schools that can turn out clones, but God doesn't want clones. He wants everyone to be distinct and different. And so, rather than trying to Emulate someone else. May your desires be the Lord Jesus, like Him. Because somewhere in His nature and in His character and in His ministry, in the expression of that word which is in Jesus, you'll have a portion of it. Because he's the fullness, the totality of God's fullness was in him. And you can't have that totality, nor does he want us to try to, because he is that totality. But having been glorified at the Father's right hand, he sends forth upon his body a ministration of himself, that each individual receiving of that ministration together, that we all, with all saints, might be able to apprehend what is the length and the breadth and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you might be filled unto all the fullness of God, not me, we, in union with him. I don't say be yourself, but be yourself after God has worked on you and transformed you. Be that self. He made you what you are. Not that you might continue to be what you are. He made you what you are that you might become what he wants you to become. A worm crawling? That's all right. But as you walk according to the law of life, That's all he asks. Walk according to the law of life. You'll find yourself curled up in a cocoon and wondering what it's all about. And yet helpless to do anything about it as God brings you to helplessness because if you and I are going to know the exceeding greatness of his power, and love and truth and wisdom, we're going to have to lose our own strength and wisdom and knowledge. We're going to have to become weak that we might know his strength. Fools for Christ's sake that we might know his wisdom. But coiled up in that leaf with the cocoon around them, not knowing what it's all about. Nevertheless, the law of life is functioning. It's functioning. 
one day it comes forth different, change, transform, metamorphose, metamorphosis. The word, the word metamorphosis comes from that Greek word that Paul used where he says we're changed from glory unto glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So be content with the way you are. No, I shouldn't say be content. Accept the fact God made you the way you are. That he has a beautiful plan that as you do God's will, walk in his ways, submit to his dealings, you'll come forth in the life of the Spirit with that kind of character, life, ministry, divine enablement that God has in mind which will be an expression of the living Word of God. Knowing that, then, you don't ever try to be like anyone else or bemoan your lot. Why did God make me this way? He didn't make you that way that you might continue that way, but that you, in that state, might learn weakness, helplessness, inadequacy, Learn your own foolishness. That as you submit to God in His ways, in God's mighty workings, He'll bring you forth, a member of the body of Christ, before which all the saints and angels will marvel and admire you in the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus comes to be glorified in the saints and admired in all those that believe. I think that's all for this morning. Thank you. Just a minute, I feel like maybe pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this gathering of your people. We've come together this morning, Lord, to sit at your feet and hear your word. Lord, we just pray that these days that we're here, well, howsoever, how many there might be, that you would grant, Lord, that you would make your people to be uh, open, receptive, hungry, thirsty, and grant, Lord, that there might come forth words of truth and wisdom and knowledge and words from your heart, words that will remain with them, words that they will be able to apprehend by faith, that it might enter into their hearts and become living truth within them, that thou desirest truth in the inward part. Hasten the day, Lord, when this beautiful body that we anticipate and believe for and expect will begin to blossom forth in the earth. You said that your people would take root downward and bear fruit upward, and that you would fill the face of the earth with fruit. And we know, Lord Jesus, that you are even now preparing in the body of Christ the total answer to every human need, many as there are. Therefore, may we be faithful and diligent and walk with you that we will be a part of that one loaf, that one bread, that you have designed to satisfy the hunger of the multitudes. In your name we ask it. Amen. This morning we open our spirits, our hearts, our lives to you. We thank you for that washing, moving, stirring of your spirit, of your presence, preparing, opening our being, enlarging our capacity and granting us truly, Lord, spiritual eyes that we might see and understand. For you've said, Lord, within your word that there's a people to whom it's given to know the mysteries of the kingdom. And Lord, we would know the secret of the Lord, that which you have, that you greatly desire to share with your people. And I ask this morning for that abiding anointing that will release, Lord, that depth of word not just information, but a flow of spirit and life moving out and touching us, changing us, opening, opening us up, Lord, 
and enlightening our understanding. I ask, Lord, that abiding prophetic anointing as our brother comes, quicken, bless, and anoint. And in all, Lord, we give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. I think we'll turn to that same chapter we were in yesterday, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. This chapter, Paul was relating the manner in which he came to Corinth and the determination he had when he came to Corinth that he would know nothing among them save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Because that was his determination to know Christ crucified, he came crucified. He came identified with him. He says, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were, was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. And he tells us why, that your face should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit he says, we do speak wisdom among those who are mature, but not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, in a secret, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. The hidden wisdom. Hidden, yet openly spoken for. But hidden. Jesus went up to the feast, as it were, in secret. He was right there at the feast. But as it were, in secret. They didn't know who he was. And God has a way of um, hiding truth from the wise and the intellectual as far as attainment in this world is concerned and to reveal it unto babes. And Jesus rejoiced in the Spirit one day as he thought of that. I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in thy sight. And so it's very true what Brother said, that uh, if we're intellectually minded, uh, if we put a lot of emphasis on the scholastic and the academic and, and our ability to comprehend, we miss out because God reveals his secrets to babes. Even so, Father, for it seemed good and nice sight. And so we thank the Lord for his ways and for the truth that he's pleased to make known to the humble, to the meek, to those who come to him as babes. And even though we talk about coming to maturity, uh, there's no maturity that takes us beyond the realm of babes when it comes to the love of God. So in understanding, be men, said Paul, but in, ba in malice, be as babes. And that should be a characteristic that remains with us all through life. As far as attitudes of forgiveness and mercy and love and things like that, always to be tender as babes. And that's what real maturity is. How be it all says in understanding, yes. God wants to change our minds until we comprehend, even with our minds, the things that God has been pleased to reveal to us by his spirit. Even the hidden wisdom, we talked about the manna that was that was um, given to the Israelites, and then we talked about the special food for the priests in the holy place. But there was still a further realm, and I, no doubt you've all had a certain amount of instruction in the tabernacle. There was the holiest of all realms. But I believe God is seeking to lead a people in this hour. A holiest of all realm. Outer court, the cross, the atonement, also cleansing by the water at the labor, then coming into the holy place, where the light of that realm was the candlestick. A new realm, I believe it's more or less this Pentecostal era that we've known the last 50 years, 100 years. 
the realm of the spirit, which we rejoice in, which we are thankful to God for, but there's another realm. I remember one teacher wrote, do a little diagram of the tabernacle and had the three realms, and he says, some say there's still another realm. He says, don't they know the veil was rent there? It's all one realm. Yes, in God's provision. But even though the veil was rent, it doesn't mean that you and I go in there. The veil was rent when Jesus died on the cross, and there stood the priest before a rent veil and saw no glory there. He wasn't smitten. We don't read where he was smitten because the glory of God had long departed. And so you see, it's true, God rents the veil at the cross, but Paul speaks about another veil. Remember how Paul put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the glory that was on his face, which glory was being done away and he put the veil there, and I just say this in passing, so that the children of Israel would not see the fading away of the glory. He didn't put it there to hide the glory. When everybody was squinting because they couldn't stand the glory coming from his countenance, he didn't know, grab a cloth and hide it. He beckoned to them, come near. And fearfully they drew near, and he gave them the instruction that God had given him in the mount. And I know it says in our version, till he had done speaking, he put a veil in his face. But every other version of it says when he had done speaking, he put a veil in his face. Which is confirmed by the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, when he said that Moses put a veil over his face to the end, that the children of Israel would not see the end of that which was abolished. One translator said, an older translation, uh, I mean, as far as generations go, the Weymouth translation, so that the children of Israel would not see the last rays of that fading glory. It was a fading glory. And as it faded away, Moses recognized that glory is departed. He covered his face so the children of Israel wouldn't see the last rays depart. But Paul says, not as Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel wouldn't see the departure of the glory. But we with unveiled face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory unto glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord clearly telling us that we've got something surpassing what Moses had and wouldn't you and I settle for what Moses had <laughs> so easily but not as Moses I uh, see things like that you know and we're considered to be far out I figure we're still just in the shallows we're still just <laughs> getting our feet wet a little bit I have not seen nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things that God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, ye the deep things of God. So in the holiest of all there is another food, hidden manna. It is in a golden vessel. As God told Moses, take a vessel of this manna and put it in the Ark of the Covenant to be kept for your generations. Be kept there. They never ate it. No priest ever ate it. Be kept for their generations. I think kept for this day and hour. That hidden manna. Incorruptible. If it had lain out on the ground, it would have disappeared by noon when the sun got hot. But because it was in a golden vessel and in the presence of God, it was kept, intended of God to be kept throughout their generations. I think as a reminder to them what God would do in the fullness of time. We don't read what happened to the Ark of the Covenant. They're still hoping they'll find it over there somewhere. It's too bad that so often ministry that goes to Israel goes along with all these carnal, natural things that they're so excited about over there. Because when Messiah is revealed to Israel, it's going to be the Lord Jesus Christ revealed in the people who know him and who walk with him. And Jesus said, you shall not see me 
until you shall say, Blessed are these that come in the name of the Lord. And that's when they'll see him. When Gentiles or Israelites from all nations, a, a man from Kenya, Nigeria, or India, or Africa, comes to them in the name of the Lord, they'll see Jesus and they won't see him until he's revealed in that people. And then they will see him. And to them it will be life from the dead, as Paul said. But the casting of the way of them meant reconciliation for, for the world. What shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? And so we, we know we're in a very wonderful hour, a very tremendous hour. We anticipate as we come into this holy realm, this holiest of all realms, to begin partaking of the hidden manna, that incorruptible food, Christ, the resurrection and the life, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. The hidden wisdom, this is what he's talking about when he says, as it is written, the, the, these things of the hidden wisdom are things that I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. This is the hidden wisdom that God has been pleased to make known to his people which I believe uh, God will continue to unfold in this hour as the people come into the holiest of all realms. And Isaiah cried unto God for God to come forth and do something. For it is a time of great need. He cried unto God and he says, God, when we weren't looking for you to do anything, you came forth mightily. We weren't hardly expecting it and you did it. No, he says, if ever we needed you, it's now. And why don't you do something about it now? And that's the cry of many of God's people throughout the land. God, we need you far worse now than they needed you 50 years ago when you moved by your spirit or 100 years ago when you moved by your spirit. You came forth very sovereignly. And, 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 but suddenly the prophet was caught away in revelation and declared, Since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear Neither hath the eye seen, O God, besides thee what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. And Paul quotes that verse here, except that instead of saying that he's prepared for those that wait for him, as Isaiah did, he says the things that God has prepared for them that love him. So what's really the difference? So that waiting for God and loving God, it's one and the same thing. I know it's a day when we don't like the word wait. I mean, you just can't wait. I mean, they got escalators, you know, and got off the plane. Get on the escalator, but so you get on, you have a ride. But this one is for those who are standing there. This one's for those who are walking. I mean, it's carrying you, but you still got to walk. You still got to go faster. Than... <laughs> it's a day when we just don't, can't wait. And we can't wait because time is so short. And yet, I think 50 years, 100 years ago, they had much more time for God than they've got today with all our fast things. I think they had more time for God back then than they do today. But waiting for God isn't just sitting around uh, filling in time, you see. Waiting for God is just what it says. God, we just have to wait for you. We can't do it without you. And it seems a noble thing to be always ready to do anything that needs to be done. Always ready to minister, always ready to preach, always ready to travel, always ready. But Jesus said to his brethren, who didn't really believe in him, your time is always ready. My time has not yet come. And so uh, let's not think that always ready is a good attribute. Sons of God who seek to move in the realms of the Spirit have a time. They wait for God's time. They move in God's time. 
And I believe that's going to become increasingly more important. As we come to this hour when God is going to so coordinate his mighty workings and his people, that timing will be so important. I thought of this when they landed this man on the moon. And on their way back, they said, now any moment now, they'll press the button that will put them in the proper orbit or whatever to get back to Earth. It had to be right specifically at a certain split second when they press the button. Otherwise, they said, if they miss it, they go off in orbit perhaps around the sun. How important in this day when everything is geared to uh, a vast, intricate machine, the whole society is just geared to a... The whole society almost, the whole realm is like a computer, as it were. Everything coordinated. So timing is very important. And it's no less important in things of the Spirit, especially when God's mighty movements begin to take place in the earth in a greater way than we've known. And that's why when God was to give Ezekiel a very profound word for the children of Israel, he first of all gave them a vision of heavenly things. He did the same with John on Patmos. I believe he's doing the same with us. He's giving us a little understanding, a little glimpse of heavenly workings. Because unless we have that, unless we know that God has it all planned and everything is intricately planned and woven together in his purposes, uh, we'd be apt to just strike off to do anything that seems it should be done. It seems it's the right thing to do, so we do it. But when you come to recognize that we can do nothing, and I mean thoroughly understand that we can do nothing of ourselves, which I pray God will bring us all to that, for even his only begotten son came to that. Think of it. That he came to the place because of his covenant relationship and walk with the Heavenly Father he realized, I cannot do anything of myself, but only what I see the Father doing. And so he lived in that heavenly realm. He lived that in that realm. For no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Jesus said that while he was here on earth. And we must come into that. Only God can do it. Remember in all that we're saying, in all that we're teaching, in all that we're exhorting unto, we realize only God can do it. Amen. But the thing that encouraged me when I realized I was going to be a teacher, I didn't ask for it, didn't want it really, because I grew up in Pentecost and the only minister that was really effective and the work of God was the evangelist or a miracle worker, so you wanted something pertaining, you know, something in that realm. And uh, not just to be a dry teacher. And, uh, and I admit it, it's dry. If God doesn't, send it forth as rain. It's dry as dust. So... It's so essential that in this hour when we believe God is doing a new thing, and I, I'm persuaded of it. If it isn't now, when's it going to be? We know we've come to the end. And the prophet said, and Paul confirmed it, that the hidden wisdom that God is making known to his people concern things which eye has not seen and which ear has not heard and which have not entered into the hearts of men. It's entered into your heart. So what's God going to do? Well, you ask me. I said, well, I don't know. Great thing. A new thing. But if it hasn't entered into our hearts or into our minds, don't expect us to try and tell you precisely what it is. Nor should we, I don't think we should be uh, 
so ravenously hungry that we just want to eat for the fun of eating. Uh, if you found honey, don't gorge yourself on it till it makes you sick. He says, eat so much is sufficient for thee, lest if you eat too much, you'll vomit it. And so we like honey, and honey in the scripture speaks of wisdom and knowledge. But you don't gorge yourself on it because it's so sweet. You take a little. And so we pray, as Jesus bid us to pray, give us this day our daily bread, which means give us today what we need today. Give us that portion we need for today. We don't need any more. We try and get any more and store it up like the manna. It stinks and breeds worms. Wormy. We need that fresh manna every day. We need that fresh oil every day. Dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. David says, Lord, you have anointed me with fresh oil. We need that fresh oil, that fresh anointing, that fresh manna, that fresh bread. Like we mentioned, though, that bread that was in the holy place there six days, still, in our way of thinking, because it is in the presence of God, I'm sure it was fresh and meant something to those priests. They alone in Israel could eat of it. Nothing wrong with the manna. But here was something special for them. And God has something beyond that for us. The time will come when we will not speak like we're speaking these days. For God will have taken his people on and there will be new realms to talk about, new areas of truth. We don't delve into it too much. We don't pry into it too much, I say too much. For God wants us to have a, a spirit that reaches out. But we just know, we ought to know, we must know but coming into this new realm, it's, it's a realm that no man can go in and appropriate on his own. And from the time that the children of Israel gathered together and ate the Passover lamb with bitter herbs, as we mentioned yesterday, because their journey was to be a journey that would involve much bitterness. Nevertheless, God would, God's intention was, in every place he led them, was to lead them to a place of refreshing and rest. But the Ark of the Covenant went before them to search out a resting place for his people. Isn't that tremendous? The Ark of the Covenant went ahead, searching out a resting place for his people. And they said, there, the cloud is moving. We must move on. God's gone ahead to search out a resting place for us. And when they would get there, they murmured, they complained, this is not what we thought, this is not Canaan, this is not a place of rest, no figs here, no pomegranates, no fruit, no water. Because of the murmuring of their hearts, what God intended to be a resting place became a place of murmuring and complaining, disappointment, because they hadn't come to know God. Their hearts were not prepared, the psalmist said. They set not their hearts are right. For the margin says in some Bibles, they prepared not their heart. Nevertheless, God was preparing their hearts unknown to them, and he desired that they would understand that the way in which he was leading them was preparation for that land. God never told them that that next stopping place would be Canaan, or the one after that, or the one after that, or the one after that. Forty-one times he led them in the wilderness. Never once did he indicate, now this is final. But we always want it to be final. Whenever something great happens, the old slogan comes out, like came out in the early days of Pentecost, this is that. If this isn't that, I'm going to hang on till this, till that comes. <laughs> Forty years later, God moved again, and they said, this is that. This isn't that, I'll hang on to this, till that comes. But the trouble is, the trouble is that when the time comes for God's people to move on, He takes away 
the first that he might establish the second. He takes away the first that he might establish the second. We try to hang on to it and lament the fact that somehow uh, it's not there the way it used to be 40 years ago, 100 years ago. And the reason is God's taking it away because he's got something better. He's got something better than eight or ten great healing evangelists going around the country setting up their tents and praying for the sick. God took it away. He's got something better. He's got something better. And what God has in mind, and that's just in one area, of course, the physical healing. A renewing of the covenant with his people who walk with him, that healing will flow through the body. It just flow through the body. Without a great healer, someone in need, you just go over as God leads and lay your hands on them and they're healed. And God is going to do that more, not only in healing, but in other areas of ministration. That all members of the body of Christ might have a very vital function. And that will do away with the schism in the body of Christ. For God giveth more abundant honor to those parts which lack, that there be no schism in the body, but that the members have the same care one for another. I never saw that a year or two ago. Striving to set up some kind of a structure, some kind of a system, so that there be no division in the body, get into this system, this structure, under this covering, under this whatever, this apostolic order, eradicate the schism. And Paul says it's because this honor that God has for all members is lacking, and God giveth more abundant honor to those parts which lack, that there be no schism in the body, but the members then will have the same care one for another. So that if there's a hundred people here, you've got 99 people concerned about your welfare. But if that honor is not there on the body of Christ, you've got yourself to worry about. But as members of this glorious body, you've got every other member of the body concerned about your welfare in a very real vital way. As truly as when you cut your finger, everything gets working there to, to heal that cut. It's, whatever comes, the body sends out the necessary life to heal that injured member. How much more in the body of Christ, the body of our Lord Jesus. A body has thou prepared for me, Jesus we hear him saying, coming into the world, you're not interested in sacrifice and offering anymore. God, and he quoted from the Psalms, sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared for me. In burnt offering and sacrifice for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, so God, you don't want all these goats and bullocks and pigeons, you don't really want that, then what do you want? Then said I, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. That's what he wanted. And that was the commitment of Jesus when he came. And that's why he didn't go forth throughout the land. In virtue of his messianic office, in virtue of the fact that he was a healer, or because he was an apostle, or a prophet, or a teacher, but that great one that Moses spoke about who would come, he never went around. I'm the one that, you know, I'm the prophet, I'm the evangelist, I'm the teacher. And everything that he did, every work he performed, everything he spoke, he only re required that people would receive it because he was saying words from the Father. And he himself, taking that position as is that one dwelling in this body that God had prepared had one commitment. I come to do thy will, O God. In the role of the book it is written of me. But he went away. But it's all he had to do was live here in earth 33 years to do everything that was required of him. 
as far as his work in the earth is concerned. Then he went away into a higher minister in the heavens. A higher priestly ministry than could ever have come about on earth. He could not have even been a priest on earth because he wasn't from the right tribe. For our Lord sprang out of Judah, concerning which nothing is said about priests. But having gone to a heavenly realm, God gave him the priesthood that God conferred upon him a priesthood of a higher order than the Aaronic priesthood. Confirmed by the scriptures, it's right there in the Old Testament, but there wasn't enough scriptures to make any impression on the interpreters of the word in that day. Because you know how you're supposed to interpret scripture? Get a doctrine? Well, get all the pros and cons on it. Fifteen scriptures against, fifteen for. So uh, maybe you can find a few more con, pros and con, and so you, you, that becomes good doctrine because you've got piles of scripture for it. But there's only two scriptures in the Old Testament that confirm the Melchizedek order of Jesus. Two scriptures. Literally hundreds that speak of the priesthood after the order of Aaron. And yet the Holy Spirit is able to take those two passages and show from the scriptures that the time would come when God would do away, completely do away with the old Aaronic order and bring in a new order after the order of Melchizedek. You see, only the Holy Spirit can do that. That's why it's, it's so essential that you and I come to a place where we not only have his spirit dwelling within us, where we have him, but where he has us. We've got to come to that. Not only where we have him and we thank him that he has condescended to come and abide in these temples which we are. And God brings us to the place where we belong to him. That these temples which we are are temples that belong to him, the Holy Spirit. Come possess this temple, his Zion. From it let thy glory shine. And God wants to possess this temple. He wants to possess this temple. I don't know what kind of dealings God must yet do with in each one of us to bring us to that place where we recognize, not just with our minds, but with our hearts and our whole attitude, our whole way of life, we just know we are not our own. We are bought with a price and that we are his. God help us to continue to recognize we have no rights. We have no rights anymore. We belong to him. And he wants to possess us through and through. And I believe that's also part of the holiest of all realm. Where we come out from the realm of gift and ministry into a realm of his abiding fullness. Going out of one realm into a greater not forsaking what we have, but seeing it swallowed up in something greater. Not always easy to explain because people get a, a little concerned. You mean something beyond gifts that we don't need the gifts then anymore? In him, in Christ Jesus, are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. It's all in him. And what we have in his gifts is a little portion that he gives. A word of wisdom. Uh, could stand and say, God said this. God showed me this. And that's very precious. It's a word from God. But there's something higher, and that is to walk in wisdom. Because you can stand up and give tremendous words of wisdom and go out and do some very foolish things. And so God gives 
a portion. And really the gifts are that. It's a portion of God's own nature that he distributes upon his people. And we thank him for that. But he wants to bring us into a realm where we live in that realm. We abide in that realm. That's John 15, which you can't help but read it and not just appreciate the tremendous truth that's there. And I'm sure we recognize that we're far from experientially really knowing any depth of it. Abide in me and I in you is the branch. Uh, can do nothing of itself except to abide in the vine. So no more can ye except ye abide in me. It's all very simple. Very beautiful. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. If ye abide in me, my words abide in you. You shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done. You know, we've tried to make that work so often. Lord, you said. We quote the scripture. Scripture is God. In case God forgot. God, you said now. Try to make it work. But there is coming a day, I'm confident, where God's people are abiding in him, and he's abiding in us in such fullness that anything we ask him, he does it. But you see, God could hardly just answer all our prayers now. Uh, we would uh, ruin God's work in our lives. Because in that day, abiding in him... <coughs> Your thought has been taken over by the mind of Christ. You ask, what is the will of the Father? You ask according to his will. And God says, anything you ask, he'll do it. <laughs> I'm not saying we don't have a foretaste of all these things we're talking about. I'm sure that somewhere in the church, God has given a foretaste of all these wonderful things that we're talking about. But let's remember, it is a foretaste. So that when Caleb and Joshua came back from Canaan with a few pomegranates in their hands and grapes, carried the grapes and the big branch on their shoulders, what a tremendous, what a tremendous uh, thing it was when they landed back home in the camp there with Kadesh. And they said, look at it. That's the land that God has for us. Isn't that tremendous? So all we're doing really is trying to show God's people a little bit of the fruitfulness of Canaan. To uh, cause us to see and understand, yes, it is. It must be a wonderful realm. And they recognized that. But they saw other things that terrified them. And because of the fear, they did not appropriate that land. It's well and good that you and I sing about Canaan now, but when we come to the doorstep of Canaan and God says, now is the time to go in, our hearts better be prepared right now. Because on that day, and when we begin to see the, uh, the might and the power that's arrayed against us in heavenly places, our hearts would melt too if they're not established now steadfast in him in the manner in which it was in Caleb and Joshua who saw the fruit of the land but who went with a different spirit the Bible says they had a different Paul says writing to the Hebrews the word of the report did not profit them because it was not mixed with faith in those that heard it they were not, it was not mixed with faith. The word was not mixed with faith. There's different ways that some translators bring it out. Their hearts were not united in faith with those who brought the word. Those who had the word, those who had faith, Caleb and Joshua, they declared what they saw, and God's intention was that their hearts would be joined unto those who brought that good word. Because, like we mentioned, Faith is in the word that goes forth to do whatever God 
wants to accomplish. Faith is there in that word. Not in heaven that you search out the heavens to try and get the faith for it, or not in the deep that you would say, who, who can go down there and bring us up that power to do it? But the word is neither even in thy mouth and in thy heart, even the word of faith which we preach. And so there is faith in an anointed word to do whatever God's intention is in sending forth that word. I say the anointed word. I mean the word that comes forth by the Spirit, from the Spirit. And so these hidden things, Paul says, God has prepared for them that love him. Hasn't entered into a heart and mind, but God has prepared it for those that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. We can't see it. We can't hear it. With our natural eyes, our natural ears, our natural understanding. But God has revealed it by his Spirit. And so if God doesn't reveal it by his Spirit, I think we better leave it alone. No doubt there are many, many wonderful things there yet that God would reveal. But if he is not revealing it by his Spirit, we better leave it alone. For the Spirit is searching. The Spirit searcheth all things. Yea, the deep things of God, literally the depths of God, the deeps of God. Deep things, then you're thinking of uh, maybe gifts and things that God has to dish out to his people. But it's the depth of God, the deepness of God, the deeps of God. It's God himself that the Spirit is searching out. These deep places in God, the Spirit is searching that out. Spirit is searching. Paul says, writing to the Romans, that he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit. Because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. God is a searching God. Searching out. The Spirit is given to search out those depths in God. I wonder, we're inclined, you know, I think, to take a lot of things for granted. We receive God's Spirit. We get the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Maybe get a gift or two. And we're inclined to feel, well, now, you know, we're all prepared now for you know, whatever He wants us to do. We're ready for it. Instead of realizing that there's vast depths in God that we know nothing about yet. Now, God's purpose is really to search out those depths in God and to bring them unto us. Before we continue a little with that matter of searching, let's read verse 11 and 12. For what man knoweth the things of man save the spirit of man which is in him? Simply saying, that only mankind can understand the things that relate to mankind. An animal, a bird, they have very little concept of human nature because they're of a different kind. Only those of the human family can really understand things that pertain to the human family in any degree of fullness. And so he says it's the same with God. If we have the spirit of man, then we can relate to mankind and understand what man's all about, how he thinks and feels and understands. But he says it's the same with God. So only the spirit of God really knows God, really understands God, can really relate to God. Only the spirit of God can do that. And so he goes on to say, Now, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. So that's why God gave us his Spirit. Because the Spirit alone knows God, and with God's Spirit, then God is, the Spirit of God is faithful to reveal unto his people in our total helplessness, 
having a natural mind, we're totally helpless to come to know God. Totally helpless. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. You understand? Take it slowly. In the wisdom of God, God says he let the world go on in its own way, trying to discover God by their own wisdom. After that, in God's wisdom, the world by wisdom never did discover God. It pleased God by the foolishness of the preaching to save those who believe. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. And no man can come to know God Except it comes to the cross, which is so stupid in the eyes of the intellectual. There, a man who hung there 2,000 years ago, God was revealing in that one hanging on the cross the depths of his wisdom. The depths of his wisdom. That in that man hanging on the cross, God was condemning the sin that has afflicted the human family. That having dealt with sin, we might partake of a new law, the law of life, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, to bring us back to God and to cause us to draw nigh unto God. Wisdom of God is revealed in the cross. It's wisdom. And the world by wisdom never did find God. And now it has pleased God by the foolishness of the preaching of the word of the cross to save those that believe. But the Greeks seek after wisdom. The Jews require a sign. They seek after power. We preach Christ crucified under the Jews a stumbling block, under the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. So then he gives us his spirit then to know these depths in God. And we settle for talking in tongues or having a gift of healing. Precious gifts from God. You see, eye hasn't seen nor ear heard Neither hath entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. And the Spirit is in our hearts to bring those things that is brought to us true. But that's not the end of it. To search out all things, yea, the deeps in God, to search it out, search out the heart of God. Deep, call it unto deep. A better quote of this morning. Let's just turn to that a moment. Psalm 42. I was reading that not too long ago, and I thought, now listen, now. We're, we've been quoting that verse, deep calleth unto deep, and referring to our heart's cry calling unto God. And God calling unto us and that fellowship and that relationship, but I read it in the context. And he says, verse 7, Deep calleth unto deep at the noise of thy water spout, thy cataracts, all thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. Then you go back and you read, As the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. Here's a man longing for God, longing for a drink of the river of life. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my meat day and night, while they continually say to me, Where is thy God? David, I assume it's David here, is in a place of exile. He's, he's rejected. He's uh, chased from the house of God. He says, when I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me, how I had gone with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise with the multitude that kept holy day. 
Now his soul is cast down. He remembers the good times in the house of God. Now he's rejected. He's dejected. He's cast down. And I suddenly realized that was God's dealings with him to make him hunger and thirst after God. It's not within you and I to seek after God. There's none that seeketh after God. It's just not within us. You say, I've been seeking after God. Well, then God did something to cause you to do that. God did something to cause you to seek him. God did something to cause you to thirst. And recognizing that, we... uh, We no longer condemn those who don't thirst after God or hunger after God. We thank him that somehow, Lord, you are faithful to lead us in dry places, to make us hungry. He's faithful doing it with us as he was to the children of Israel. He led them in a wilderness, caused them to hunger, fed them with manna, that you might know that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord. That's why he led them that way. He didn't tell them that until they'd gone through. But after they'd gone through the wilderness, and that first generation had failed God by not having set their hearts aright, because their spirit was not steadfast with God, nor did they set their hearts aright. They were overthrown in the wilderness. And the reason they turned away and did not go into Canaan was an excuse that they came up with that was not valid. We can't go in because our children, they couldn't stand it. We could stand it. We're grown up, but they couldn't stand it. And God swore with an oath, as I live, I will bring your children in that you feared for, and you'll die in the wilderness. And so they said, we can't go in because we love our children so much. God says, I swear, I'll bring your kids in and you'll stay out. So let's remember that, you know, and oh, the kids can't take this, you know. You better go God's way. God knows how to look after your kids and there's terrible times coming on the earth. Some awesome times. Could be very close. Who knows? But the new generation was prepared of God to go in and it's to them that he said, I have fed you with manna and I caused you to hunger. That you might know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. The old generation was dying off, and just about the whole generation was to die off before the new generation went in. So that which was judgment for the old generation was preparation for the new one. For there they were, eating of the manna, drinking of the water, going along their weary way with the rest of them, with their adults, except that they had a hope. God swore he's going to bring us in. But the older generation had no hope. They were going to die in the wilderness. I don't know if it bothered them too much. Because... When you look at the old generation in the church today, you don't see them lamenting that somehow we missed it. Because if you don't know what you missed, how can you lament about not having received it? But if God gives an expectation and a hope and a desire, then there's a certain fear. A certain godly fear. God, we see what's We see what you're doing in measure. We don't want to miss it. And so we're going to need vision. And I think I could very easily have made total shipwreck 
So it wasn't for that little glimmer of expectation, vision. God, you're going to do great things. It wasn't a case of I hope when I die I'll go to heaven. That never bothered me from the time I was saved. But in this life, God, you've got great things for your people. Tremendous things. So when you're tempted to go weary of it all and to give up, may God have established in your heart at least a vision, a hope, an expectation. I want to go in with a conquering generation. Because hope purifies. Not any kind of hope. The hope of seeing him. And it all comes down to that. Whatever our expectation is, whatever the inheritance is, and there are many aspects of it, it all comes down. Finally, Christ Jesus is our hope and our expectation. But though along the way he gives you gifts and blessings and promises you a certain ministration and gives you a certain vision of what he wants you to do, let there be no vision that God gives us <clears throat> that will crowd out or be cloud the one and only vision of coming to see him. For any other vision he gives is just something that he gives along the way to help us along the way, to encourage us along the pathway, to encourage God's people along the pathway until we come to see him. And we want to see him. And we're not particularly speaking about the second coming. Because I don't believe that there's no seeing of the Lord until he comes in clouds with power and great glory. I believe that we should be anticipating seeing him constantly, daily. In the Old Testament, they believed that Messiah would come. But before he came, David longed for him. David sought his face. The children of Israel, the elders at least of Israel, saw God. Moses talked with them face to face. One occasion, Moses said to the people, Sanctify yourselves. The Lord's going to appear tonight. This afternoon, he's going to appear. Prepare your hearts. But now we've got the notion, don't talk about the appearing of the Lord because it's going to happen in a split second and it's way down the line. Jesus can appear any time. And I anticipate seeing him appearing in the midst of his people. And I hope it happens many, many times. Paul saw him after Jesus went away. You say, well, it's sort of a vision. It's a sort of, a, it's a sort of nothing. He says, <laughs> he says, James saw him and Peter saw him and John saw him and the twelve disciples saw him. Oh yeah, they walked with him. They saw him. He says, 500 brothers saw him and he says, I saw him. And the revelation of Jesus to Paul was just as real to him as the revelation that the others had who walked with him three and a half years. And Paul used that incident of seeing the Lord as a qualification for his apostleship. Because the apostles were those who had been with the Lord and seen him and walked with him. Paul says, I, I saw him too. My apostleship is just as valid as theirs. It wasn't the first coming. It wasn't the second coming. What was it? It was Jesus. <laughs> We make the second coming to be an event. It's an event, but it's more awesome than that. It's the Lord of glory appearing. God desires you and I. He wants us. He needs us. There's an old slogan they used to have in the church. You're saved to serve. God needs servants. And you're saved to be a servant, which is not right. It's like uh, someone you just got married and you say, well, why did you marry her? Well, I needed a slave. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is that right? Yeah. It's not really that way. But I think a good wife will be a good servant. 
But that's not why you marry her, or shouldn't be. And Jesus didn't just save us so he'd have some servants. Because he's got 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands and thousands who wait upon him day and night. They need no rest. I mean, just a moment's beck and call and they can go to the ends of the earth. He doesn't need servants. He needs friends. And he has very few friends. And so Jesus called 12 apostles to preach, I know, but something that additional to that. And something first, something that preceded that. He called 12 apostles that they should, what? Be with him. And that he should send them forth to preach. Because if you're not with him, I don't think your preaching will amount to very much. You're not spending time with him. Learning his word, yes. But also learning his ways. For Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We want life, that's our pursuit. Jesus is the truth, but he's also the way. And only as we come to walk in the way, the way, his way, do we really come to truth. You can have the doctrines of truth without walking in the way, but you and I won't come into living truth until we walk in his way. Because it's walking in his way that acquaints us with him. And so we love the word of God. We love the Bible. Here's one I typed out. Just to have a study Bible. I love it. But, you know, it's, it's not enough there. It's got to come within. I worked with an architectural firm one time, not as an architect. I'm not an architect, but doing book work. I remember this one big project they had to the college. And you'd be amazed at the blueprints. I think we probably had about six inches with the structure of it and the electrical and the plumbing and the mechanical. And that wasn't the college. But there'd be no college without it. Everything was arranged there and I you know, there was mistakes in it because they're fallible. Everything, every detail was there and given to the builders to go by the blueprint. And one day, there was the college, and they opened the door, and they had me make a big uh, walnut key to present to the, the representatives of the college board, the key to the college. And there was the building, very beautiful. The blueprints were necessary. They had to go by the blueprints. But the intention was not the blueprint. Their intention was the building. This is God's blueprint. Very important. So we might look up a Strong's Concordance or another version. Get, you know, maybe this isn't quite clear, so we look up another version. Because we want to know what God said. I think that's good. But it's the blueprint. It's what God is building because of this. That's the reality. And that which God is doing because of what he said here is building into his people. That living word. And so ministration must be by the Spirit. Not of the letter. But of the Spirit, for the letter killeth. <coughs> the Spirit giveth life. But that doesn't mean like some interpretive. Oh yeah, you've got all those scriptures and that, but the letter killeth. And they despise the letter. No. 
I know what kill is. So does God. The Lord kill us. The Lord make us alive. Don't worry if it kills. Look for the Lord to give life. The letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Jesus said, the words that I speak into our spirit. And God must bring ministry to that. And the words that are spoken are not just the letter that we read, but as the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the depths of God, he searches it and brings it out in spirit, so that Paul said, which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. And so back to Psalm 42. David was longing after God as the heart panteth after the water books. How did he get that way? God had led him in a wilderness, causing him to thirst. And that's what the wilderness was for. To prepare the hearts of their people that they might long after God, that they might come to realize that their very life depended upon hearing from God. And so he fed them with manna, which didn't satisfy their appetites, didn't satisfy them. It met every need, but it didn't satisfy them. It left them hungry. Why? I fed you with manna and caused you to hunger, that you might know that man doesn't live just by bread, but by every word that proceedeth. Out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. And so the wilderness way is intended to cause you to seek after God. And if your heart's right, it'll do that. If you prepare your heart, it'll do that. If you set your heart aright, any trouble that comes will drive you to God. And so David's troubles drove him to God. And he found himself longing after the water brooks. And so, oh my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore will I remember thee from the land of Jordan and of the Hermonites from the hill Mizar. Deep calleth unto deep at the noise of thy water spouts. All thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. It is God, I'm swept away with your, with your judgments, with the troubles that have come upon me. They just sweep over me like billows. These troubles, they sweep over me, but it causes a deep to call into deep. There was a depth that God was forming in David, which he can only do, I believe, as he leads us into difficult places, wildernesses, trials, tests. It causes a, God, I'm in trouble. I must fly unto you. You're the only one that can help. And God is faithful to come forth and the Spirit searches the deep things of God. He searches the deep things of God and He's been searching your heart. Searching out your heart. Searching out God's heart. And He finds something there. I can, I can bring these two together. I can, there's something in God that you need at this moment of your trouble. You've got a deep cry there for God and God has this for you. And so He says, comparing spirituals with spirituals. It's a, uh, it literally reads that way. Comparing the spirituals with the spirituals. And the comparing, understand, can mean not only setting the one here and the other there to judge between the two, but literally bringing them together. Combining the spirituals with the spiritual. Joining together the spirituals with the spiritual. And so it's the ministration of the Holy Spirit. If you have those depths in God, crying out unto God, the Spirit says, here, this is what you need. And there's something compatible there. And so he's able to join you. Join that spiritual that's in God with that spiritual that's in you. So that there's a participation in the life of God in a more meaningful way than there was before. And we were totally helpless in ourselves to come to that. The troubles come, wildernesses come, disappointments come. We say, why, God, did you do that? Why? 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 And the psalmists, the psalmists are full of questions to God, and we're full of questions. Why, Lord? Why does all, what's all this about? Mm -hmm. And it's part of the wilderness way. It's part of the uh, effect of the manna. 
which means why, when, what, what's it all about? It means that. Why, what? Just be thankful when those questions arise that perchance God is feeding me with that heavenly food. We rejoice in the eating of it, but we don't always rejoice in the effect that it has upon us. We don't attribute it to what we have eaten. We don't attribute it to our desire for God. We attribute it to the devil. Many cases when we should be attributing it to God's desire for his people. You desire God so much, the only reason you desire God at all is because he desires you. That's why he created man. Because God was alone and he desired fellowship. Not just the fact that he was alone, but the fact that God, as one who was alone, had dwelling within him the fullness of love and mercy and truth and compassion and long-suffering and patience and kindness and grace unspeakable. It's all there in God, but nobody to share it with. He had to have a man in his image. He had all kinds of angels and celestial beings, great and wonderful and beautiful, but no fellowship, really. No real fellowship. Because they weren't like him. God had to make someone like himself, but how can God make himself? But he made a man in his image, in his likeness, not totally, like I think I said yesterday, because Adam was of the earth, earthly. And he had a temple in the Old Testament, but not the fullness of the temple. But he did have a temple. He had sacrifices, but not the fullness of it. They were types of the real sacrifice. And the first Adam was just a type of the last Adam, who was a figure of him that was to come, even Christ. A figure. So that it's not a case of God in bringing us into his image, bringing us back to that state that Adam was in, for he was just a type. It's bringing us back into an image far beyond what Adam had. For as we have borne the image of the earthy, so must we bear the image of the heavenly. For he that is of the earth is earthy, and he that is of heaven is of heaven. You say in the resurrection, I know, but before then. Adam did not die and go into the grave in order to reach the fullness of sin. He reached it in his lifetime. When he sinned, the reign of sin began to rule within him. He didn't have to die to see the fullness of it. That was the natural end of it all. You don't die and go to heaven to be like Jesus. It starts now. And the culmination of it will be that resurrection day. But the life it begins now. And you got Adam's sin because you're born in Adam, as simple as that. And you grow in sin because of that seed that you inherited from Adam. And so in the last Adam, it's because you're born in Christ that you inherit his righteousness. And you continue to grow in righteousness because the seed of his life is within you, born again of the incorruptible seed of the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Never forget that. There's two Adams. And our Lord is the last Adam. And as we born the image of the earthy, so must we bear the image of the heavenly. So God wanted a man in his image because if he didn't have a man in his image, he would not have real relationship with anything. Real fellowship. So he made a man. Giving him the potential. Communicate with him, fellowship with him, walk with him, be one with him, be his expression in the earth. God never forsakes his image, his, um, his plan. When man spoils it, God doesn't give it up. When God gives a promise, he doesn't draw it back. We don't appropriate it, it stays there. 
in the earth. He doesn't take it back. Well, I tried to do it anyway. He waits for a certain time when that which God planted in the earth, he, he says, now, this time, now it'll come forth. For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven, and water the earth that it might cause the things that are sown in it to spring forth in life, that it might give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. It shall accomplish the thing that I please. So if he sent it forth into the earth, it stays there till it is fulfilled. I take a thousand years. Two thousand years. It's in the earth. God says, I won't take it back. So it accomplishes the purpose for which I sent it forth. And in this day and hour, God is beginning, I believe, to cause life to spring forth from seeds that he sent into the earth years ago, centuries ago, millennia ago, God said to Israel, You shall be unto me a holy nation and a peculiar people and a kingly priesthood, a kingdom of priests. Never happened. Never happened until Jesus rose from the dead and ascended. Oh, he had a priesthood. It's not a whole nation. It's one tribe. God is going to keep alive his intention in keeping a priesthood in the earth. But it stays there in the earth until it springs out of the earth. It will not return to me, boy. It shall prosper in the thing wherein I sent it. So that once you really see that and know that, as you read the scriptures, you read it, and you're, you're quite convinced that no, we don't see that in any sense of fullness. It remains a promise. Used to be, well, I know that's what God said and that's what God wanted, but somehow it hasn't happened. It doesn't look like it's going to happen. But now, I see it and read it and, oh, that's still future then. Father, the glory thou hast given me, I have given them. That they may, that they may be one, as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they may be one in us. You see what God wants now? God wants us to be one, so come on now, we got it. We've got to be one. Forget your doctrines. Forget everything that you, you know, taught to believe in the church and that. Just flow together in love. Be one great, big, ecumenical church embracing all who call upon the name of the Lord. Nonsense. Jesus didn't pray for that. He prayed for a people who would be one with him as he is one with the Father. And as one with the Father, he Oh, clearly the words that the Father gave him to speak had come to such commitment to the Heavenly Father that he would speak nothing except what the Father gave him to speak. Mm -hmm. 